Hello, this is PSMN 511, Pastoral Ministry. This is week six, again using Bill Scheidler's work on pastoral ministry. That's a nine from the study guide. Focuses on the pastor's apparel, poise, and mannerisms. I would call it perhaps the pastor's persona, how he projects himself and comports himself in society. Apparel refers to literally that which is fitted, adjusted, or prepared, dress, vesture, garments, clothing. And while it might seem somewhat frivolous to have a, a lesson that focuses on this, when you look at the Old Testament and the clothing, the vesture of the priesthood, the, uh, the law and the descriptions are quite involved. And of course, uh, under the law, the, the garments of the priest were filled with symbolism from his headdress uh, all the way down to his feet. So uh, apparel is important and not in the same fashion it was in the Old Testament, but certainly, and I can tell you as a pastor, it can be very important. Poise is our state of being balanced. Uh, equanimity, reposed. Equanimity means someone that's um, open to, you know, people questioning you or approaching you. A repose, dignity, bearing. And then mannerisms, characteristics or marked adherence to unusual or affected manner, style or, or peculiarity a peculiarity of manner and in behavior or speech. In other words, the things that you do, your, your mannerisms, sometimes you're not even aware of them, but sometimes they can be quite distracting to other people or off-putting, as we say. And um, I think all of these really are important for us to consider in a pastoral role because people, they look at a, a leader, a leader of a church, a leader of a business, and there's a sense in which the, the leader sets the standard. And um, I know nowadays it's a little different in terms of how pastors dress than it was, say, 20 years ago. Often I will come to the pulpit without a tie. Um, but you got to be cautious. I, there are some people that are in their congregations apparently are comfortable with them being quite relaxed in their apparel. And, uh, you know, they wear the, uh, what they call those, uh, the straight jeans and uh, maybe a sports coat, if even that, sometimes just a shirt and tennis shoes. Um, I'm not judging anybody, but I think we have to um, be careful not to become too casual. And the truth is, some of the older generation really are offended by it. I, I know one time at the church here, uh, our air conditionings in the sanctuary weren't working very well. And I decided I wasn't going to wear a suit and jacket and a tie and all that stuff. So I wore, you know, dress pants and a nice shirt. And sure enough, one of the ladies there was offended and she had a guest and she said, I invited her to come to our church because her pastor was wearing street clothes. And then here she comes and there you are. And I said, well, man, I'm sorry, but it's pretty hot today. And I typically would wear a jacket, but I didn't wear it that day. So my point is simply that for whatever reason, people sometimes can be offended by how we how we dress and certainly our, how we carry ourselves and our mannerisms. I've been in uh, uh, a church member where a pastor had certain mannerisms um, that he wasn't even aware of, but they were repetitive and, you know, listening to him preach and yet see him do this over and over and over became distracting actually so we have to be very aware of that it's good when you start off when you're pastoring or preaching or evangelizing whatever the case may be to actually videotape yourself and watch it and see if you see something there that would be um, distracting to the hearer and try to correct that so we need to try to avoid offending now let's face it try as we might there are going to be people that are going to be offended, even when we've done our very best to just speak the truth in love. 
And yet I've had over the years many people come and or leave the church and they were upset because of something that I said. And sometimes it was just a joke and uh, they didn't take it as a joke. Sometimes uh, some folks just don't have a sense of humor. It's just the way they were raised or whatever the case may be. And uh, where 99% of the people might laugh at it, there may be somebody there that's, that's going to be offended. And it's going to be impossible not to offend somebody, but we should not we should make sure that we're, we're doing our best not to be offensive in word or in deed, in dress or in mannerism, that we're, we don't want to be anyone who puts a stumbling block in front of somebody trying to come to Jesus. Um, as, as the book says, though it is impossible to completely eliminate the possibility of offense, it's necessary to try not to offend when it can be avoided. That particular PowerPoint has several typos in it. But even Jesus offended people by speaking the truth. And sometimes the truth will offend those who aren't ready or don't want to hear the truth. Word offend, I thought this is interesting, it's from a Greek word. It means the trigger of a trap or snare. In social behavior, it refers to an action that causes another person to stumble. Uh, we hear that term sometimes about these folks that have triggers, um, something that sets them off. You know, um, uh, in politics, obviously some of these riots, there's something that's triggering it. So now, um, if um, on any given day in America, I mean, there are situations where the police, rightly or wrongly, uh, end up pulling their weapon and taking a life. And it happens to Caucasians and to African Americans for sure. And it's and when it's wrongful, it's tragic. It's horrible. Um, but when an African American, when it's publicized and the media seems to really love to publicize any account and any episode that they're aware of where a Caucasian police officer has taken the life, again, maybe even justified, of an African American. And that's a trigger that has been setting off riots uh, before the facts of the case are known. Indeed, in many cases, it seems like the facts of the case are irrelevant because this is a trigger and, and there's an offense that's just waiting to be exposed. So as a Christian, certainly, we don't want to be... Um, offensive and to and to trip those triggers but again the f life uh, is such that there are going to be people that you know when you stand up and uh, adjust your shirt collar they're going to be offended it's just just the nature of some folks and sometimes I've just had to say I I, I apologize um, I wasn't trying to offend you misunderstood what I said but uh, you know I, I'm, I'm very sorry and, uh, and yet that was that was not enough, and they were just angry. And then it was just a matter of time till they were angry again. And uh, when I was young in ministry, I used to let those things keep me up at night. Now, about 30 years into ministry, I realize that's the nature of the occupation. People are going to be offended, and they're going to let you know about it. And you just have to be able, at the end of the day, to look at your own heart and be able to say, that was not my intention and uh, I didn't mean for, for anybody to be offended. I wasn't trying to be offensive. And if you can say that with a, with a clean conscience, then you don't have to, to feel guilty about it. And because that's some people are just going to find a reason to be offended. But we have to do our part, to do our best not to be offensive. Um, Christ came as a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense because there were some people who just weren't ready for Messiah or were so um, engaged in their own status in society that they weren't willing to yield to um, the authority of Jesus in the religious arena. And for them, he angered them and he called them out and he, <laughs> he, uh, he exposed their hypocrisy. And for them, he was speaking the truth, but obviously they were offended. Uh, however, Christians are warned not to cause others to stumble. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1-13 through 13 teaches that how we express the love of Christ is more important than what we know. 
So, you know, you can be right and be wrong at the same time. You can be right on the facts, but wrong in your attitude. And um, the Apostle Paul talks about you could do all kinds of things, but if you don't have love, it doesn't profit anything. And so, number one, love has to has to shape the words that we speak and how we express them. There are many erroneous beliefs about what true Christianity is, and many weaker Christians have set unbiblical standards and restrictions upon themselves. And sometimes uh, new Christians um, don't embrace a holiness standard and don't embrace Christian standards, and so they're still practicing things that they need to to grow uh, spiritually and learn no longer to do. But then there are others who, when they become a believer, for them it's as though they have to be perfect. They set an unrealistic standard and they, they um, of course, that, that is the standard. Jesus was perfect. But for them, everything is wrong. Uh, they, for them, for some people, it's almost like unless they were in a monastery, they would never feel like that they're doing right. And they're offended by anyone who does anything that offends them. And so as we mature, we realize that some of the things that, that we might think are, are, you know, sinful aren't necessarily sinful. They may not be uh, helping our spiritual growth, but they're not necessarily going to send us to hell. And so maturity helps us to sort through those kind of things. Mature believers, however, should not flaunt their liberty. Once we've understood that some of these things are not uh, necessarily sinful, but if our brothers offended in them. So in Romans, Paul talks about uh, believers eating meat that had been offered to idols. And in that time, they would offer different kinds of meats to idols, and then they would sell that meat in the marketplace. And there were some who believed that the spirits of the gods inhabited the meat, and there's a sense in which if you eat it, you're, you know, you're receiving the strength of those gods. And Paul says, we know there's nothing to that. It's just meat. But it was cheaper when it had been offered to the idols than it was if you went to, say, a butcher. And so some of the Christians are like, hey, I'm buying the cheap meat. There's nothing wrong with it. But some of the new Christians, they still were a little conscientious about that. They didn't want anything to do with that because it represented something associated with idolatry. And Paul says, listen, there's nothing wrong with the meat. But if I offend my brother doing it, then I'm wrong. And he says, you know, whether if I never eat meat again, I would rather do that, not eat the meat, than offend a brother. And so we need to be aware of these kind of things that might be offensive to others and, and not flaunt them. That is, not, not push the issue, not say, you know, or not berate them or belittle them for having their beliefs. They may need to mature, uh, but we don't want to be that stumbling stone for them. In Romans chapter 14, oh, it teaches that we're slaves to Christ now and forever. And we cannot get the idea that we can live any way we want. I think about James and Jude. They identify themselves as servants of Jesus Christ. Slaves, actually, the, doulo, the word Greek word doulos meaning slave. They were half-brothers of Jesus. They grew up in the same house with Jesus, but they considered themselves servants, bond servants of Jesus Christ. And as a bond servant of Christ, uh, a, a slave or a bond servant, a bond servant's a slave that's been set free but chooses to remain with the master. Um, you don't get to do whatever you want. You do what the master wants and you surrender to him because in the case of Christ, he knows what's best for us, better than we know ourselves. And so when we yield to Christ in all things, we can realize our best life in Christ. So we must be living, willing to live our lives in a way that shows respect for others and how they feel about things by not causing them to stumble. It's not an act of love to flaunt our liberty in the presence of those who may be offended by it. Some of the areas of potential offense, which I've already mentioned, is the way we dress. There's some general guidelines. We should look neat. We should look like um, that we respect God by taking the time to 
to give our best, to take the time to dress in a way that that reflects the sacredness of the of the office that we hold. And uh, the author gives some specific guidelines. Dress like a professional for your setting. Achieve balance. In other words, you don't want to try to rich, dress so rich and so ornate that it offends, but you don't want to come in, you know, wearing rags uh, either. You want to find that balance. You want to dress in a way that honors God. Um, but also the way we talk, the words of our mouth, the things we say. Sometimes we use slang. I've known some people from other countries that come to America that didn't realize if you watch American TV, you're going to hear all kinds of profanity. And some people coming to America learning uh, English, they don't realize that some of those words are considered swear words or that they're obscene. And I've had friends who were using words that they didn't realize were were swear words. And so they, they learned. Uh, some One of them was preaching, and he used a word that shocked a lot of people. And the pastor later took him aside and said, do you even know what that word means? <laughs> and and uh, he didn't. And but he was he was ashamed that he had used that word. Uh, avoid inappropriate jesting, suggestive language. We should always be gracious. We should always we shouldn't be given to rumors or tail bearing or cutting other people down or talking about them behind their back. That that is never attractive for a pastor to be um, to be talking bad about other people. You know, you could be talking to someone. They could have. They may have even started the conversation. They may have said, "Oh, what do you think about this guy? I can't stand him." And you might say something like, "Yeah, you know, he kind of, he kind of irritates me." Well, the person that started the conversation then go out and talk about you. So you have to be very gracious. I think you're never going to be wrong by speaking nice about other people. Um, the way we carry ourselves in public, courteous, good manners, table manners. And here's one in restaurants called, in leadership, they call it the waiter rule. And the idea is that how you treat people who are servants in society or servers, like a, um, a steward on an airplane or the waiter in a restaurant, um, that that reflects your real character. And I have been, unfortunately, with pastors who seem very nice to me and very kind and and uh, cordial and got along good. But then I've been with them in restaurants where they were just rude to the waiter. It embarrassed me, especially when they were visiting my town. And these were restaurants where where I would uh, where I would eat. Um, and that that bothers me when I see that. It says something about their character when they're like that. We have to be kind to to the least of these. And as much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brother and Jesus said, you've done it unto me. Another thing's personal hygiene, the way we take care of ourselves. Um, you know, we're not always going to be the most physically fit person in the room necessarily. I've I kind of go up and down. I've been a bodybuilder and a power lifter, and I've even just a few years ago, I was in fantastic shape, some of the best shape of my life. Um, but then I have two compressed discs in my back, and I'm not able to do the kind of exercise I did or even to walk much at this point. And so I gained a lot of weight back. So we have to give grace to people. We don't know what's going on in their and their um, thyroid. There are legitimate thyroid issues, but we don't want to be a person. Uh, unfortunately, I've seen pastors who were s extremely overweight and then, you know, and they may blame it. Some of them have end up getting sugar diabetes as a result, although some are born with sugar diabetes. So I'm not saying that that's anything wrong, but when you develop it because uh, you eat too much and you're grotesquely overweight, then, then that's not a good testimony. And I've uh, one gentleman I knew, he was so heavy, and when we had church dinners or whatever, it was obvious why, because he ate so much, it was embarrassing. We don't want to be that person, um, and there are times when I'm in public like that where I will eat less than I than I even want to, um, because I don't want to uh, to appear to be someone who's um, who's just given to gluttony. The way we conduct ourselves in the homes of others. I knew a pastor who would visit the sick and then he, he went to the restrooms and then 
for one reason or another, he got hooked on pain pills and he was going into their, he was visiting a lot of people and he was going into their restrooms and looking in their medicine cabinet and stealing their pain medicine. Ultimately, he ended up in jail and um, he's passed on now. I'm not quite sure. He kept trying to come back. He kept trying to break free from it and people would give him opportunities to preach again, but then he would go back into it. It was an addiction that he was really struggling to fight. I think about times when I've stayed with people at their homes when I was preaching at a church and I always tried to do these things to to leave the the restrooms clean to every day if I was preaching for a week and I was in the guest room of their home, I would make my bed every morning. And um and then always leave thank you notes or send a note later to thank them. This just speaks well of a pastor. Actually, that's the wrong slide there, but I want to talk about the pastor's ethical conduct. The lack of ethics and integrity can destroy ministries. I've seen it over and over again. Some of the biggest ministries in America, I think about Willow Creek, a huge church. I think they had tens of thousands of members. Something their pastor had done with a woman that was staying in their house, which is never a good idea, um, ended up just really destroying his ministry and the church. They were struggling. They had several um, branch campuses. They all were struggling. And so uh, our ethical behavior is imperative for effective ministry. Ethics is the study and philosophy of human conduct with emphasis on the determination of right and wrong. I have a lot of typos in these PowerPoints. I apologize for that. If I had more time, I'd fix them, but I had a long day today. Um, ethical, in accordance with right principles as defined by a given system of ethics or professional conduct, and ethic, the standard of character set up, <laughs> UP, set up by any race or nation. So these are the things that we're talking about here. We talk about the pastor's ethics. Why are they so important? Well, your ethical standards shape your reputation. People see you. If you're unethical, it undermines your message. You can speak about God's love and God's truth, but when they don't see it practiced in your life, then it undermines the words of your mouth. Your ethical standards become your testimony. When someone sees you, um, like I've been in stores where someone left money at the, in the... Um, at the self checkout, and uh, you know I could stick it in my pocket, but usually I give it to the attendant there at the store. Who knows what they do with it? I can't answer to for them, um, but I can just answer for what I do. And so I return money, or if I see someone drop something, I've you know let them know. And this becomes a powerful testimony. I remember once working at a factory when I was going to seminary. It was a hard job, and um, I heard two of my supervisors walking. They didn't know I was behind them, and they were talking about me. They, I irritated them because they would try to hide things that were going wrong on the shift, and I just refused. I wouldn't lie about the numbers of production or anything like that, and they said, well, there's one thing about it. They were walking in front of me, and they said, if, if Mark tells you something, you know it's true, and... Um, so they were complaining on the one hand, but I got a compliment out of it on the other. And because they knew they could trust me, they gave me a position with a pay raise in an area of the, of the factory where, number one, I couldn't see what they were doing. But number two, I was on my own back there. They had to have someone back there they could trust to do the work and do it well. And so I was uh, – God rewarded me for just being honest. Now, it was difficult sometimes – you know, when I knew I had to do what was right, knowing that my boss wanted me to do wrong and I just refused. But ultimately, it worked out to my good. So God will reward that. Your ethical standards determine your ultimate success or influence. Again, people watching our lives. You think about words related to the topic of ethics on the positive side. They're words like honesty, uprightness, virtue, morality straightforward, above board as they say, which means you're not hiding anything, fair with 
other people. The negative side of that is dishonesty when you say one thing and do something else. Deceitfulness where you're trying to hide things. Malice. I don't know how I put malice on there twice, but uh, deceptive or crafty or unjust. These are the negative things that undermine integrity and ethics. The biblical basis for ethics is integrity. I like this quote by C.S. Lewis. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is watching. Integrity implies such honesty that one is incorruptible or incapable of being false to a trust or a responsibility or one's own standards. Integrity uh, communicates the idea that things are in alignment, that everything is as it seems or as it should be. With respect to how a pastor relates to other leaders and pastors, speak to them and about them in a positive way. Uh, I have a gentleman in my church who works with our senior adults. Uh, he never has a negative word about anyone, he, and he's just he's just a delight to be around. Be willing to work with them on that should be joint efforts, even when you're not in charge. I've had people. Um, at church, if they were in charge of something, they would be all passionate about it and, and really wanting to promote it and uh, and just all engaged in it. But if they weren't in charge, if someone else was trying to spearhead a project, they wouldn't even get involved. And yet they would be very critical of others who would not get involved on their project. And that's the thing. We have to be willing to help others. Uh, the Bible says if a man would have friends, he must show himself friendly. And if we want people to work with us, we have to be willing to work with them. Um, when someone else is speaking, give them your attention and visible support. In other words, nod, acknowledge them. Don't be looking at your phone or looking away or simply thinking about what you're going to say as soon as they stop talking. Learn to listen. Also, answer emails, texts, and phone calls. You can't just ignore people, especially as a pastor. Um, we have to learn to respond. For me, I'm not much of a phone person. I have no problem with emails and texts. But uh, if someone calls, I, I will answer the phone. I return borrowed books before it becomes embarrassing. This is kind of interesting. I had my a cousin of mine was attending church, and he was a new Christian. And the pastor borrowed several cassette tapes my cousin had of, a, of another minister. And that pastor never returned them. He never did. And then what happens, like it says, before it becomes embarrassing, you have them so long, you just kind of hope the other person forgets about it. But uh, my cousin never was angry about it, but he never forgot about it either. And he was a little disappointed in the pastor that he would do that. Uh, keep the lines of communication open over straying members. So if you're with an, another pastor in town and there's a, a member that's um, that's straying, maybe they're going to the other church, um, you have to fight the urge to be uh, wounded or offended when they go to the other church. But at the same time, if this person is engaged in um, conduct that, that would reflect poorly upon that church, then I think, as they say, keep the lines of communication open to say, you know, I understand uh, Brother Smith is at your church and listen, I hope that he settles in there and, I, and you know, I, I just pray that it works out well, but I just need to make you aware that, that this is going on in their life and, um, and maybe you can help them with it. Be careful not to proselytize but respect lines of authority. Proselytize means trying to pull people out of somebody else's church. And um, I've had situations where I wanted to hire a, a young couple to be youth pastors at my church. They were volunteering at another church, and uh, but I didn't want to just try to hire them away. So I called the other pastor and said, listen, you know, I understand they're volunteering at your church. But I really feel like I'd love to offer him a position. And that pastor told me he wished I wouldn't do it. And um, I don't know that he had the right to say that, but he said it, and I honored it. I never called them. They never knew that I would have hired them 
to pay them to do what they were doing for free at another church. With respect to other members of the congregation, we have to remain impartial. I mean, let's face it, some people are easier to get along with than others, but we have to treat everyone uh, equally. Um, when someone tells us something in confidence, we have to keep those confidences. If, we, if someone comes and shares us something that's very personal to them, and they find out it comes out uh, and come from us, that's, that's a terrible thing to do. Pastors have to learn to keep those confidences. Now, sometimes they, they tell us, but they've told somebody else. And then it gets out, and then they want to blame us. And we have to stand our ground and say, no, sir, that did not come from me. Maintain discreet conduct toward the opposite sex always. Um, the devil will tempt us anytime he can. And we have to be aware of that. We are not ignorant of the devil's devices, the Apostle Paul said. So we don't want to counsel them alone, which I never do. If I have a, a female that needs counseling, often I have, I have a woman, my wife, who would do the counseling instead of me. Or if they want to come and talk to me, then I would have my wife or a secretary in the room during that time. But I, I do not counsel the opposite sex alone. Nowadays, it's getting to where you don't even want to counsel the same sex alone. Um, they say do not travel alone. Sometimes you can't help but do that. I have a, I knew a minister. He would never go anywhere that his wife could not go with him. He would never travel alone. Um, but honestly, there are many times I've had to travel alone. And you just have to um, be discreet and you have to you know, uh, maintain your integrity even when you're away from your spouse. You learn to show courtesy to others without undue familiarity. You don't want people thinking you're flirting with them just because you're being nice. So you have to keep that very clear. Uh, avoid physical contact that might make them think that you're trying to show affection to them. I can tell you there's a pastor. If I mention his name, some of you would know who he is. He's actually... Uh, a pastor within my denomination. He's on some of the Christian networks. But uh, just recently, he had to take a, he had to step down from ministry for a while because of his conduct toward the women that worked in the office at the church. Now, he didn't have an affair, but some of his comments and suggestions um, reflected so poorly that that they essentially reported him to the. Um, to the uh, the leadership within our denomination, and he's having to step back from ministry and get counseling before he can return to, to his pastorate. And here's the thing. Love, admire, and honor your spouse in public and in private. Um, this lets people know that you're not... Uh, that you're not out there looking for anybody else. Sometimes, for whatever reason, a, a, a man, a pastor, or a leader in an organization sometimes can look attractive to the opposite sex. And um, and we just have to be aware of that and, and not allow it ever to become an issue. I always try to maintain a professional distance with anybody, even secretaries or anybody. I mean, I'm, I'm nice, I'm kind, um, I'm respectful, but... I never, I've tried, and I don't think that I ever have crossed that line uh, with any of my employees or with members of the church. Here's one they say, don't demand the use of a certain title. I remember I had a, a man come into the church to lead a choir. He led the choir from our university of our, of our school, Lee University. And they traveled all over the country. They've competed on on different choir competitions on television and stuff. And uh, he was newly appointed to this position, and he had recently gotten his doctorate degree. And uh, when he came in, I called him brother. We, you know, I grew up in church calling another believer brother this, brother Smith, brother Johnson, whatever. And uh, when he came, I, I, I said, hey, brother so-and-so, and he said, it's doctor. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. And then when I was introducing him, to the uh, church, I forgot and called him brother again, and he corrected me in front of the church, which immediately um, cast him in a bad light for my congregation. In fact, they mentioned it later. They know 
I have uh, two iron doctorate deg degrees, one of them a PhD, but they just call me Pastor Mark. And so I have no problem calling someone doctor or whatever title they want to be called, but I would never um, correct someone like that in public if they didn't use a title like doctor. And uh, later, I think he, after he, he had recently gotten his doctorate degree, and when it's new and fresh, people, I guess they want people to know they have it. And uh, he's kind of mellowed out a little bit since then. And we need to take criticism without reacting, without getting defensive. And you especially don't want to retaliate because people are going to criticize. That's Again, that's the nature of ministry. You know, when you read all this, you start wondering why in the world would anybody want to be a pastor? Well, it has to be a calling. We've already talked about that. If God has called you to it, he'll see you through it. So, um, And people are going to criticize and critique. And you just have to learn not to get offensive and defensive and certainly not to retaliate. You know, the battles of the Lord's. I had a, a lady outside of town in my church in Kansas who had a, a shop. They sold produce. And she got mad at the, the church. Really, I hadn't done anything. It was her, her and her husband were having some issues. And she wanted him to leave the church, and he wouldn't do it. So then she just took it upon herself to criticize our church to anybody that stopped at that produce market. And one of our church members stopped there. The woman didn't know this woman had started coming to our church. And this lady at the produce just started really criticizing me and the church and... and um, the woman was pretty upset and she came to me and said, you need to go tell her to stop. And I said, you know, I'm going to let the Lord fight my battles. I'm going to just do my best. I'm going to love people. I'm going to have integrity and ethics in all that I do. And uh, I'll let my testimony speak for my defense. And uh, ultimately our church grew and the woman didn't really have any effect, a uh, negative effect on us. Maybe some people came to find out if what she said was true. I don't know. But w people are going to criticize and we can't always be uh, reacting to it. We have to be true to our convictions, but easy to entreat. In other words, uh, each of us are going to have certain convictions, the way we feel about things, things that we really believe are important. And uh, and we have to be true to those, especially if, if we're convinced in our own heart they're biblical. But we can't be so dogmatic that we're critical of everybody else who doesn't see everything exactly the way that we do. And we should never use the platform or the podium, uh, the pulpit, to to um, call out people individually or to embarrass anybody or to try to adjust some people in the congregation. Just speak the word. I preach expository, so I preach through books of the Bible. And it says what it says. And typically God uh, knows who needs what and when they need it. And so... When I'm preaching the word and it calls out people for gossip or whatever, I preach the word. And nobody can say that I'm doing it just to, to get at somebody. I just let God's word speak for God. Here's one that I really, as I read this, I had to um, really correct myself on. Do not constantly talk about how busy you are. Because it can make your people think you're too busy for them. And I've been guilty because I've, honestly, I've been very busy at points in my life working. On, I've completed two doctorate degrees while I've been here at the church. And I was also heavily involved in the denomination, on the state council, on different boards, and pastoring, and teaching, and really just doing too much. But I, I think I complained about it too much. And then people were afraid to ask me, you know, for counsel or anything like that, because it's like I was too busy to be their pastor. And so I'm trying to learn. I am still far too busy, but trying not to to talk about it from the pulpit or even complain too much to my wife about it. Um, I just have to get myself in a position where I can pull back from some of my responsibilities. <laughs> That's an odd way for that to come in, but to be honest in the use of your time. So don't claim you're more busier than you are, number one. And number two, as a pastor, you're being, your congregation is supporting you to do ministry. 
to be preparing yourself for a sermon. So that might be, I mean, you can watch the History Channel can be a good way of helping understand historical context for different things. I'm not saying you can't watch TV and there's leisure time. You can have your own time and you can watch sports. But um, if you think of it in terms of a 40-hour work week, although ministry is much more than that, um, we need to be given time, whether it's reading Christian books that are helping us to become better prepared as pastors, reading scripture, prayer, visiting people, um, involved in church work, involved in even just working around the church. Uh, But be honest in our use of our time. We have to be aware of accepting those who disqualify themselves elsewhere. In other words, someone may have been in another church. Now they come to your church because everybody wants more people. But if they did something, if the pastor calls you, we talked about it on the other foot, but if the pastor calls you and says, hey, and I've had this happen, uh, you know, I understand this couple's coming to your church, and I just need to let you know when they were at our church, they really caused some problems. They really hurt some people's feelings. And I just want to let you know to be um, cautious about getting them involved too soon. And I take that advice um, very seriously. Uh Here's a good one. Don't borrow from church members. (laughs) You know, earlier it said, don't uh, don't borrow and then uh, from another minister. But um, here it's saying, well, I didn't say don't borrow from another minister. It says if you borrow, return books, whatever, in appropriate time. Here it's saying don't borrow anything from church members. And uh, you have to be cautious about that for sure. If you break it, you know, I've done that before, borrowed something and then had it break. And I just bought a new one and gave them the new one. Do not enter into businesses of members expecting special discounts or favors. When I first came to my church here, uh, one of the young men in the church is a barber. And um, he told me he would cut my hair for free. And I I said, no. I said, I'll pay. And he said, well, you know, he wanted to give me a discount. And so for many, many years, you know, I accepted a discount. And um, but here recently, I've just I've given him more than even the cost of the haircut sort of as a tip above and beyond and he probably doesn't even need it he does quite well actually but I just I just felt in my spirit that I needed to do that and so I did that in the larger society so we're talking about your behavior with respect to other ministers and uh our behavior with respect to our own congregation. Then there's the larger secular society. Don't violate laws in the work of the church, so obey the laws. Avoid the privileged character image, like for asking for ministers' discounts. Um, That doesn't reflect well on the church. Uh, Obey traffic laws. Although I gotta be honest with you, some of the laws in America are difficult to understand. So you have a speed limit which to me, I'm, I'm kind of a stickler for obeying the rules. So I feel like if it says 55, I'm only going to go 55. But I found out in Atlanta, I had people cussing me out and, and cutting me off and track because I was trying to go the speed limit. I found out it's against the law to be in the fast lane going the speed limit. You're holding up traffic. So it's kind of confusing. Um, but the, I guess the key is, as they say, to go with the flow. Uh, but unfortunately, I've gone with the flow and gotten a ticket. So do your best to obey the traffic laws, certainly in areas like school zones and things like this, parking uh, and all of that to make sure that you obey the laws. Keep appointments. I remember when I first came here, this church was uh, had been a district church. It was down when I got here and we eventually grew to, I think at our, our highest, we were about 350 members. But um, there was a much smaller church in town, which really only had maybe less than 20 people. And the pastor asked me to come and speak to his men and uh, his men's fellowship. And I agreed to do it, but I didn't write it down and I forgot. And then I saw him later and he said, you know, did something happen? I was, and I was like, why? He goes, well, we were waiting for you. I felt terrible. To this day, I feel terrible for missing that. So keep your appointments. Keep the church and properties attractive. I think that's important. You don't want people talking about your church as being uh, what we call an eyesore. Um, Be courteous at all times. 
work toward good relations with neighbors and neighboring businesses. Um, when I went to my first pastorate out of seminary, the church, the pastor ahead of me, had at least a copier. But then the church couldn't afford it, and he just stopped paying the lease on the copier. What well, was leased for two years? And he, his attitude was, if they want it, they can come and get it. And um, so I got there, and I went to the copier, the place that, that leased the copier, and I said, I am so sorry that the pastor before me has done this. And I said, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. I'd like to buy it outright from you. And so I got a small loan from the church and bought it. And that that businessman was so um, so happy that I did that, that he started attending church and he brought his family and grandchildren. They all started attending the church simply because I went to them and said, hey, listen, I know someone did you wrong. I want to do right. And it impressed him. So doing right is, is a good thing to do. Always pay bills on time. Um, again, it just is a bad reflection on the church. I've had come into churches where the pastor, the outgoing pastor, left big bills and left them for, for me and the church to cover. Fortunately, one of my overseers at one point, um, when he found out about it, he passed that bill on to that pastor at the next church and said, this is your responsibility. You're going to pay it. I think this is a good one. Leave large tips. I tip 20% or better at restaurants. I always hate it when I hear someone say church people are the worst tippers or pastors are the worst tippers, which probably isn't always true, but I don't want to add to that myth.